Alpha is bound and on her knees. Her face is bruised due to the hardships she has undergone. She had planned to dedicate her last moments to defending her motherland, called Saldia, until Logue and his group captured her. Her two captors, Ines and Nidhogg, who's a dragon, look at Kalpha with contempt and smug smiles. Logue is the only one with a kind face and warm smile, which makes you wonder what kind of person he is. Behind is the army of immortals, which is entirely undead. Kalpha is distressed that she managed to get captured at such a terrible time. Enos announces to her boss, Logue, that she has captured the woman Logue was looking for, which is Kalpha. Logue is excited and asks Kalpha if she's the legendary appraiser, Kalpha Schnevel. He also congratulates Enos and Nidhogg on a job well done. Kalpha used her appraisal skill on the army of immortals, and she can see that they're made up of undead humans under the control of the necromancer, Logue. She had heard rumors of the immortal army and couldn't believe that they could be true. Many of the deceased have been resurrected in recent years, and this army is rumored to be the strongest. It is still growing in power, thanks to the powers of Logue. She can't believe that a man like Logue, who has such a sweet face, could be the rumored necromancer. And unlike Ines and Needhog, Kalpha can't sense anything vile coming from him, unlike the other two monsters. Ines talks about how Kalpha is one of the world's seven sages protecting the land of Saldia. She's the strongest appraiser, and if they can use her power, Ines feels they'll be one step closer to accomplishing Logue's long-held wish. She proposes they raise a toast tonight, but Logue is in a different mood for festivities. From the looks on Kalpha's face, he asks Ines and Nidhogg if they did anything rough to Kalpha aside from tying her with a rope. He's concerned that she looks so exhausted and reminds the others that Kalpha is supposed to be their guest. Ines defends herself by explaining that Kalpha was exhausted long before they captured her. Nidhogg reveals that the Saldia Empire is currently under attack by monsters. The Saldia Empire's situation has gotten worse. Its army has panicked and it has probably been beaten and driven to a corner. Hearing this, Kalpha grits her teeth as she remembers the battle between the monsters and the Saldia Empire. She had been the general, leading the army, and at first she thought she had the upper hand, but the monsters kept attacking, one after the other, overwhelming her forces until the tide of the battle changed and the situation got worse. She had been informed by a soldier that the Emperor Nad had fled. This had crushed her confidence, hearing that the Emperor had abandoned his people and that she, one of the world's strongest sages who held the world's strongest power, was left to fight. Her army has scattered, the downfall of the Saldia Empire has begun, and now she is caught by a necromance at a time like this. Logue is sympathetic and can see that, from Kalpha's point of view, being captured at a time like this when she was most needed was adding insult to injury. He deduces that the monsters and the Empire must still be fighting somewhere around here. Kalpha suddenly gets an idea, and she makes a request to Logue. At this rate, her country will perish sooner or later, and she will also be killed. If her empire had a mighty force, they might have a chance to get rid of the monsters and save her motherland from the brink of extinction. She feels that since she's going to die either way, she's willing to bet everything on this last-ditch effort to save her country. She begs Logue to save her country. Enos is disgusted that a human like Kalpha would dare make such a request of her boss. She tells Logue that they could dispose of her once they make Kalpha use her powers to achieve their purpose. Logue has other ideas. He reminds Enos that he too is human, but Enos doesn't see how that changes anything. After all, any human aside from Logue is stupid. Logue is shocked that Enos could be so brazen about her disdain for humanity. If they want to achieve their purpose, they can't make the people whom they need their powers look like fools. This purpose they keep mentioning intrigues Kalpha. Logue offers Kalpha a deal. If he saves her country, will she listen to what he has to say? Without even hesitating for a moment, Kalpha accepts the deal. She even vows to give her mind and body to Logue. Logue does as he says, and he asks Nidhogg to fly ahead and scout their enemy's strength from above. He leaves the command of his immortal army to Ines. Ines and Nidhogg obey swiftly. Kalpha decides to use this moment to ask Logue why he wants her, but he promises to tell her after the fight. He tells Kafla that she'll be their guide to the battle. Already, the Saldia army could be doing better. They're being cornered from all sides by monsters. One of the soldiers tries to motivate his fellow soldiers by telling them not to give up and that they'll fight to the end for the sake of their empire. From where she is, Kalpha can see the battle is getting worse for her side. Logue asks her to give a breakdown of the enemy's forces. She explains that the Saldia empire is currently being attacked by an army of goblins led by the ten goblin kings, each with their own generals. The goblins are all E-rank, but the kings are D-rank. 
Nighthog reports his findings. The human army is drastically losing, but something is weird about the army led by the goblins, as C-rank monsters like Minotaur are joining them, which shouldn't be possible for low-rank monsters to cooperate with each other. Logue wonders if someone else is pulling the army's strings. He gives orders to Nidhogg to wait in the sky, and if he sees the soldiers attacking the goblins, he should blow them away. He tells Ines to deal with Minotaurs and releases Nidhogg and Ines from the Necromancer's Pledge. Ines is the progenitor Demon King, and once released, she takes on a new form with six wings on her back. He also releases his army from the Necromancer's Pledge. Kalfa is astonished at Ines and Nidhogg's identities. The Imperial Army is cornered at a cliff as they're prepared to make their final stand. Ines and Nidhogg come to their rescue. Ines tells the captivated soldiers they should be honored as they see her master at work. Meanwhile, Logue uses the magic of destruction to create a black hole and suck all the goblins into it. Ines reports that she took out all the minotaurs, while Nidhogg reports accomplishing his own work. The soldiers thank Logue and don't shy away from showing them his status window. The soldiers are terrified to see that he's a necromancer, but he assures them that he's not here to fight them, but the soldiers don't buy it. One of them asks Logue why he's helping them, and Logue explains that he's just keeping to the promise he made with Kalfa. As per their agreement, he turns to Kalfa and asks her to use her power to cover up his occupation as a necromancer. Kalfa agrees to it, but however she knows that Nidhogg is a dragon king who appeared in fairy tales passed down in the Saldia Empire. She also knows that Ines is the first demon king who once plunged the world into chaos, and they are legends from thousands of years ago. She then deduces that for Logue to possess such a mighty force, his real purpose is to make friends. Seeing this, Kalfa asks the soldiers to change their perceptions of necromancers, since one of them saved them. To fulfill Logue's purpose, Kalfa promises to disguise his occupation as a necromancer into that of an adventurer and asks if he'll join a guild in the Saldia Empire. Logue promptly accepts and sees this as his new start. Logue has always been alone. Ever since he was in the orphanage, he has been lonely and longed for friends, but now that has changed. The disguising of his occupation as a necromancer to an adventurer is complete. He can now make friends. He's so enthusiastic and close to tears as he thanks Kafla. He says it was worth following her into the Empire. Kalfa tells him that's no problem. After all, she's just fulfilling the promise she made to him. And although they call it concealment, Kalfa has only just made the status label disappear. They're interrupted by a soldier reporting that the Emperor Nad, who fled from the Empire during the battle, has been killed by the army of goblins, meaning that the next head of the Empire will be Kalfa. Kalfa can tell that the citizens have already heard about the monster attack last night, but she asks the soldier to hide that the Emperor met an untimely death. Logue remarks that it must be hard for Kalfa, but she doesn't see it that way. After all, she's only succeeding the shameful Emperor who abandoned his people, and that is of little significance. She then advises Logue to register as an adventurer at the capital's largest guild. After this, she tells him there will be an ability test, and she thinks he can pass it. Inez takes offense to this, as she thinks Kalfa is looking down on Logue since it should be obvious that Logue can pass the ability test. She even promises to kill Kalfa if she looks down on Logue. Nidhogg jokes that Ines is always so hot-blooded when it comes to matters concerning their lord. Nidhogg and Ines are two of Logue's most loyal followers. Kalfa marvels at how small Nidhogg can become and is encouraged to touch him. Kalfa then tells Logue that she notices that Nidhogg and Ines don't vanish like the other immortal armies, and Logue explains that it is because he used the art of incarnation on them, meaning that they're fully revived, unlike the other undead that make up the immortal army. The immortal army is imperfectly revived using reanimation. Kalfa is amazed that Logue can perform such feats, and even the seven sages of the world are unable to use the act of incarnation. Logue brushes it off as simply being the highest attainable skill for a necromancer. Kalfa then suggests that it would be better to rank Logue's skills and magic as SSS rank and above. Logue admits that he needs help understanding this rank, as he has never belonged anywhere. Kalfa knows that this makes sense as he can only check his rank once he joins a guild, so she thinks it will be quicker for him to get an explanation about that at the Adventurer's Guild. Logue agrees and wants to hurry to the Adventurer's Guild. He bids farewell to Kalfa and thanks her for the favor she granted him. Logue and Ines find the Adventurer's Guild, but Ines notices that Logue is nervous 
since this will be the first time he won't be seen as a necromancer. Ines tells him there's nothing to worry about and he'll be able to make friends. Nighthog throws his support and tells Logue that no matter what, he'll still be their master. He enters the guild and is greeted by a woman who welcomes him to the Saldia Empire Adventurers Guild called Ascalon. She asks if he's here to take the certification exam for new adventurers, and Logue answers yes since the adventurer came out on his occupation certification. This gets everyone's attention, and they look at Logue with suspicion. Lagurdo, an adventurer, tells Logue that by being too confident, people will be taken aback by his mannerisms, and he'll be given a job specialization soon. Logue needs clarification and asks what Lagurdo means by that, and Lagurdo gives a demonstration of what he means. He shows Logue his status and tells him that when an adventurer is affiliated with a guild, a new element will be added to their status because Ligurdo has a higher physical and muscular strength compared to others. He has an aptitude for swordsmen as his job specialty. Other examples he gives are that those who excel in magic will be called magician, and those with agility are called thief. Logue becomes depressed, as this means that since he's only an adventurer, he's not spectacular in any ability. Ligurdo explains that if Logue is diligent in accomplishing the guild requests, he may even get a job that he's good at. Ligurdo's dream is to have an SS rank ability, and it's revealed that Kalfa has an SS rank in intelligence. Logue is asked to place his hand on the crystal so they can look at his abilities. When he does that, Logue can see that his job occupation as a necromancer is hidden. But that's not all. All of his abilities are SS rank, and he has a ridiculous amount of experience points. Due to all these excellent ability values, the crystal ball is having difficulty deciding a job specialty for Logue. Still, Nobody wants to believe that Logue is this busted. Ines isn't surprised. Her master has stopped several rampages of monsters like her. Even when Logue tries to conquer the world, he is defeated multiple times. People still can't believe SS rank is actually a thing until a well-respected adventurer named Gran tells everyone to calm down and not get too excited over Logue before the promotion exam. Gran suspects that Logue used status concealment to tamper with the crystal and tells him to prepare for the test and not fail woefully. Ligurdo explains that this is the second time that Gran is taking the promotional exam. Ines is angry that Gran called Logue a scam, but Logue tells her it's alright, and he's getting used to it since it's better than being feared. Ines asks him if it isn't better for him to be friends with people who won't say harsh things to him. At the guild exam venue, it turned out that Kalfa was the examiner. She's here because she became aware of the lack of military strength in the country during the battle against the Goblin Army. And so she's here to ascertain the strengths of everyone taking the exam. One group is taking the Adventurer Certification exam this time, and two are taking the Promotional exam. The first group is called Logue. The second group is a C-class team led by Ligurdo called Dreadfire. And the third group is a B-class team led by Gran called Regulus Heart. For Regulus Heart, who are taking the exam to be promoted to A-rank. Their test is to defeat the boss Hydra with eight heads, Orochi, who is on the 10th and final floor. If they're able to deliver all eight of Orochi's heads, they pass. Logue's mission is to clean the first floor. Inez isn't pleased by this, but Logue is enthusiastic to help people. The members of Dreadfire have a mission on the sixth floor to subjugate the wolf pack. A Dreadfire member looks at Logue suspiciously she doesn't believe that one person could have all their abilities in SSS rank. Logue uses dragon attribute magic and typhoon to create a gust of wind to carry all the trash. He then combines this with a black hole and sucks all the trash, cleaning everything in five seconds. Logue has passed the adventurer's certification exam. Meanwhile, Regulus Heart is in trouble on the 10th floor. Logue is looking forward to seeing Dreadfire subjugate the wolf pack, and Ligurdo is excited to show the rookie adventurer how things are done. But on the sixth floor, Ligurdo has a hard time dealing with the wolf pack. He's even crying for help, which disappoints Ines. She can't believe that such weaklings are breathing the same air as her lord Logue. But Logue sees things differently. He's excited to see how an adventurer does things, and even thinks Ligurdo is cool. Ines thinks he's been too merciful to the Dreadfire team. One of the Dreadfire members tells Ligurdo to pull himself together, as they're running out of health potions lately, so they can't use it without thinking. Ines asks Kalfa if it wouldn't be more useful to kill Ligurdo and add him to the immortal army. Logue tells Ines to cut it out, as supporting each other and facing tough enemies is what being an adventurer is truly about. Ines tells Logue that he's exaggerating, 
But before Logue can reply, he senses something, and so do Ines and Nidhogg. They can feel something disturbing on the 10th floor. Logue tells Ines and Nidhogg to wait for him as he goes to investigate. He even asks Kalfa to look after Enos and Nidhogg for him if something happens to them. On the 10th floor, we find that not only does Regulus Hart have to contend with Orochi, but they're also dealing with a horde of goblins. Gran orders his teammates to fight instead of complaining, but it's not enough, and they need reinforcements or they'll be destroyed. One of them suggests that they ask Dreadfire for help, even though they're from a weaker rank, and if worse comes to worse, they could always rely on Logue's SAS rank. These jokes don't amuse Gran, and he tells his team that he asked the others not to interfere in their exams, and it'll hurt his pride if he has to go to others for help. But this isn't the place to be saying that. Gran tells the others to run away and get help while he deals with Orochi, but they're pinned down by goblins who use poison to restrain them. Gran begs the healer to run away and get help. He apologizes to his team for being a worthless leader, but they tell him they are glad to have followed him. Gran is about to accept his fate until Logue shows up with the healer and uses another dragon attribute magic to breathe fire on Orochi and the goblins. He asks Gran if he's okay. When asked why he was here, Logue explained that when he was watching the Dreadfire fight after completing his clean mission on the first floor, he sensed something strange on the 10th floor and came here to investigate. Gran is astonished that the magic attribute he witnessed belonged to Logue, but Logue is humble and apologizes that his healing magic is very limited. He's never bothered to develop it since he's never been too seriously injured. And if he had known this would happen, he would have learned more healing techniques. Gran tells Logue not to beat himself up and thanks Logue for saving them. He was a great help. One of them promises that when they return, he'll buy Logue ale until he dies. Gran admits that it would be hard for him to get promoted since he couldn't deal with the irregularities of the situation and he plans on telling Kalfa everything without hiding anything. Logue is glad that he made it in time to save Gran, but he still needs to be done. He uses the magic of destruction to dig a hole. If you think about it, they are on the final floor and there shouldn't be anything below that, but there's a cavern with weapons on the floor. Logue had suspected the existence of an 11th floor. Regulus Hart is surprised. They have never heard of such a thing. Logue calls say that the floor wasn't created naturally, but was man-made. Gran picks up a sword and can tell it's an adventurer's weapon. Logue asks if he has any theories on that, and Gran reveals that in the last six months, two parties have gone missing in the valley, and they have most likely been wiped out. Logue hears some sounds and discovers that Ines, Kalfa, and Nighthog have come looking for them once the exam ends. Gran shows Kalfa silver armor with the Saldia Empire Imperial Crest. He suspects they must have belonged to the Imperial soldiers, so he asks Kalfa what's going on in the Saldia Empire. Two parties have gone missing in a short span of time. Goblin outbreaks and raids have been occurring frequently, which should be impossible, and yet the guild's monster subjugation requests have been decreasing. The Adventurer's Guild can't keep quiet anymore, even though they've had a policy of not interfering with the Imperial Army, and Gran feels they can't call this situation an adventurer anymore. Logue is worried that this means he can't become an adventurer in this country at the moment. Kalfa promises to try to give an explanation for whatever is happening in this country. A little elf girl runs towards them, begging for help, and it looks like Logue knows something about this girl. On the 11th floor, which shouldn't exist, Logue and his group have been met by a member of the elf clan, a race mainly skilled in healing magic. They're usually targeted for their skills and their cuteness, and they are frequently sold as enslaved people until they are now on the verge of becoming extinct. Kalfa asks Ines to stop bringing up stories about the past and defends the Saldia Empire as a place where contracts are being signed on a village-by-village -village basis to give citizenship, land, and food to those who need it. The elf girl speaks and begs the Log to help her fellow elves in her village. Log asks if their village is on the 11th floor, and the elf girl admits that it is. Her people had originally lived in a place with many forests around the east of the Empire, but a few months ago, nearby villages were attacked by monsters one after another. Her village was burned down, but after that, strange people came to her village and brought her people here by force, and they've been making healing potions for them ever since. The elves are treated badly if they ever disobey, and that's why this elf girl escapes and tries to save everyone. Logue can see that this girl's clothes are in tatters, as is her hair. He compliments the girl on being able to run away. Kalfa doesn't want to believe it, 
but she looks terrified as she asks the elf girl if humans captured her people. The elf girl admits this is the case. She explains that the elves were originally responsible for 70% of the production of healing potions, and the shortage of healing potions in the Empire must be due to abnormalities in the production line. Kalfa is angry at the fact that someone might be manipulating things behind the scenes. Logue asks the elf girl what her name is, and it turns out to be Michaela. He asks the girl to give him directions to her village, but Kalfa tries to caution him. She understands how he feels, but she thinks it's wise that they turn back for now, and the monsters will become more active at night. Kalfa also offers to send Imperial officers to investigate in the morning. Logue quietly tells Kalfa that it is an adventurer's job to be useful to the people. He summons his undead and tells Kalfa that the night is their territory. Kalfa asks if Logue is sure he wants to do this, as he will lose the meaning of the concealment of his necromancer job. Logue tells her that he's just doing his job as a necromancer. Kalfa understands and tells Logue that she'll join him, and so does Gran, but Kalfa stops them and points out that they are too weak at the moment, so Gran decides to report the matter to the guild immediately. Lagurdo signals to Ines and calls her Logue's girlfriend. She asks how she can help him, but Lagurdo whispers something into her ears and asks her to tell Logue afterward. Logue piggybacks Michaela and tells her to point out the directions to her people. One of the human captors asks the elves where Michaela went, and when the other elves refuse to say anything, he starts threatening to round them up and finish them. One of the elves explains that they don't know anything about where Michaela went. This angers the human, and he sarcastically asks if he can use the power of the S-rank ancient dragon to burn the elves and their village to the ground. He orders his men to release the ancient dragon's seal right now. His men release the seal and summon the dragon called Asgard. Asgard starts terrorizing the elves, but luckily, Logue shows up. Kalfa immediately orders the human captors to stop what they're doing. One of the captors demands to know who's stopping him from doing his business, and Kalfa introduces herself as the acting emperor of the Saldia Empire and says that the land and the elf clan are under the jurisdiction of the Saldia Empire. She orders the men to state their identity and affiliation. The captors respond by ordering the goblins to block all the escape routes. Kalfa is shocked to see the monsters taking orders. The captain of the captors remarks that he doesn't know who Kalfa and her group are, but his men have the S rank of legendary dragon god's descendant Asgard, and nothing can stop them. Nadhog asks Logue for permission to deal with the dragon, and Logue gives him permission to go as wild as he wants. Logue releases Nidhogg from the necromancy pledge, and Nidhogg reverts to his true size. He's intrigued by the possibility of fighting his own descendant. The captain orders Asgard to set the intruders on fire, but Asgard faces Nidhogg head on. Nidhogg uses Igersdale, but it doesn't kill Asgard fully. Nidhogg is disappointed that his descendant lacks the ability to communicate, and he decides to tell Asgard something interesting as an old man. He tells Asgard that if he could read letters, he would be able to steal fascinating and multidimensional skills, and their magic, which dragons only know a part of, would increase exponentially. Being able to mess with unknown power means cheap tricks won't deceive you. But even if you wield all that power, there are people in the world you wouldn't be able to beat. Is the captain of the captors panicking? Despite being an A-rank magician who subjugated an S-rank dragon, he shouldn't be able to lose. He asks Logue if he thinks he can take away their paradise by himself and throws a fire spell at Logue. Logue can see that this spell is extremely powerful, isn't just an average magic spell, and is worth receiving. He brings out a dagger. Nidhogg agrees that even up against overwhelming power, it can be bounced from the front, and so Logue absorbs the fire spell using the fire attribute enchantment, which is an SS rank magician skill, and he uses it to blast the spell back at the captors. He then brings the dagger to the captain's throat and asks him what he was doing with the elf girl before dispatching the A-rank magician. Nidhogg defeats Asgard and looks at a triumphant Logue. Nidhogg is glad to be surrounded and protected by someone like Logue, as he is able to continue to study with him, especially when there's someone who can't win, no matter what. To Nidhogg, that's why the ambitious goal of surpassing Logue has yet to be crushed, Ines is proud that her lord has managed to dispatch the enemy as expected, and Logue asks her about her progress in defeating all the goblins, which she did. The elves thank Michaela for running away to find help. Kalfa can tell a lot from the national emblem on the A-rank magician uniform, but she wants to use her appraisal skills and make him show her everything. Kalfa interrogates the captors on their purpose here. She wants to avoid resorting to rough means to get what she wants. 
The captain then tells them that if they want to kill him, they should get on with it, as he would never sell information to the enemy since he's a soldier. Kalfa sees that's the case and calmly tells the captain not to say that she didn't warn him. She uses forced disclosure to get information from the captain. She can see he's from the Balra Empire and is the captain of the 8th Magic Battalion. The captain can't believe his eyes. Kalfa explains that what she has done is within the appraisal and her strongest skill is forced disclosure, which can enable her to disclose an individual's status without consent. The captain complains that Kalfa is trampling on his resolve, but Kalfa reminds him that she did tell him that she didn't want to resort to this. The Saldia Empire is supposed to have an alliance with the Balra Empire, but it looks like the Balra is going behind the Saldia's backs to commit such atrocities as they did with the elves. Surprisingly, Logue calls her out for using such a disgusting technique on the captain. Even Enes calls her nasty, as everyone deserves to have something they wish to hide. Logue has heard of the Balra Empire, and he's sure they're a magical powerhouse. Kalfa admits that is the case. As one of the world's seven sages, the SS rank magician stands at the top over there, probably because they focus solely on increasing their magical power. Enes boasts that the seven sages of the world are meaningless if Logue isn't a part of them. Kalfa is embarrassed to say this because Enes was the first demon king, but when the elites of each country gathered and defeated the demons, they started to be called the world's seven sages. The seven sages of the world consist of the vanguard swordsman, the beast warrior, the middle guard sniper, the SS rank magician, the rear guard healer, dragon knight, and finally, Kalfa, the appraiser, who is a non-combatant. Anez pretends to be impressed, but she then asks Logue if he remembers a particular time. She uses this opportunity to start boasting about the time when the monsters were on a rampage a few years ago, and Logue punished the area's small fry because it was pretending to be a demon king. Logue suddenly remembers that time. The small fry had been the phoenix. He guessed that they didn't learn their lesson and went on a rampage in other countries. Kalfa panics as she suddenly realizes that the only reason the world's seven sages won against the monsters is because Logue has already weakened the monsters. She quickly recovers and quickly tells Logue that the people from the Balra Empire will be kept in the cathedral. She then addressed the elves, and as the acting emperor of the entire Saldia Empire, she deeply apologized for all the fear and suffering the elves had suffered. The elves forgive her, as she helped rescue them when they couldn't do anything, and they thank her. Kalfa asks if any of their people have been taken away, and the elves show her a magic circle that their people were taken through. She sees that it's a teleportation magic circle, and it's so advanced. She asks why such an advanced thing is here, and the elves explain that it is for them and that it is to steal the production technology of healing potions, and it isn't something that the likes of Jalat can handle. Logue wonders if all this effort was just for healing potions. Kalfa deduces that the teleportation magic circle's destination must be the Balra Empire, even if Jalat won't admit it. Kalfa can see that this has developed into a highly political issue and that they can't pursue this matter deeply because the country is in turmoil. Logue can see that at this rate, the elves might be kidnapped again, and he asks Kalfa for permission to seal the magic circle for now. Kalfa is amazed that such a thing is possible, and after Logue admits that it is, she gives him permission to use his sealing magic. The elves are told to wait here for some time, as the Imperial Army will soon be there to protect them as Logue and the others leave. Logue bids farewell to Michaela and tells her to take care of herself and have a happy life. Finally, they are out of the cave. Inus uses this opportunity to give Logue the message that Lagurdo left with her. The message is for Logue to come to Ascalon as soon as he's done, and it's an order from a senior, which Inus doesn't appreciate saying, so she steps on Lagurdo a little bit. Logue can hold back the excitement of being given an order from a senior adventurer. He babbles about wondering what it could be. He wonders if he's going to be chastised for being cheeky, or maybe he'll be used as a golfer and be made to carry things for his senior, which is the best part as it is the essence of being in a hierarchy. Nidhogg admits to Kalfa that Logue's image of an adventurer is a bit distorted. Logue wants to go to Ascalon immediately and runs there. Callum meets with Kalfa and explains that he rushes here as soon as Regulus Hart reports the situation. He asks her if she's all right. Kalfa tells Callum that it is about time they make up their minds, as this is the time that they will have to fight their comrades whom they fought together before. When Logue and the others reach Ascalon, 
Logue is sad to see that Ascalon seems to be closed and the lights are out, but Nidhogg can tell that there are still people inside. Logue opens the door as he believes orders from seniors are absolute, even when Ines warns him that it could be a trap. Logue opens the door and the people inside congratulate him on passing the adventurer's exam. Logue is so happy until someone dunks water on him. Ligurdo explains that this is Ascalon's famous newcomer's welcome party. Since Logue has become the guild's adventurer, Ligurdo has wanted to give him this blessing. The celebration begins. Ines admits to Nighthog that she feels lonely, but it's been long since she's seen Logue so happy. Until now, Logue has led them for a long time, and he is sometimes strict with them and kind enough to protect them by himself. However, they are still servants, and Logue has always felt lonely. In order to survive while getting hurt, Logue had to resort to learning forbidden magic, and that's why both Ines and Nidhogg have always wanted to see him be genuinely happy. Ines feels that day has already arrived. Logue is invited to a feast, and for the first time he's congratulated on something. He wonders if his fellow adventurers can be counted as friends. Michaela shows up in armor and asks to join Logue's party, as Logue inspires her to want to help others. Logue accepts her into his party. At the Balra Empire, the SS rank magician is informed by a soldier that the Empire has lost contact with Jalat and cannot use the magic circle. The magician isn't phased, as he sees this as a test, but he wonders who could seal the teleportation magic circle. Thinking about what had happened from the moment he was born and had been in an orphanage, Rogue didn't even know what country he was in. For this fact, the term motherland never sat right with him. At the time he clocked 12, the gods gifted him the forbidden job of necromancer, and that was the reason why death was always with him. This causes him to live on his own, but he longs and yearns for friends. That was the only dream he had having friends by his side. It is so sad seeing such a young boy alone because of his power. When the orphanage got attacked by demons, he was forced to leave, and ever since then, years and years have passed. He eventually became a solo necromancer, leading an undead army. He would be the one and only in his power and rank. So he could get people to call friends, he decided to go to the Sardia Empire. Thanks to Kalfa Schnabel, he became an adventurer along with his followers Inez and Nidhogg. Eventually, they had a new member, Michaela, who came so early in the morning with her excited self. She told him that because he was stronger than her, she would call him master from now on. She is pretty cute though. Rouge wasn't having it this morning, but he told her it was amazing that she had come all the way to see him alone. Dragon explained to her that it was a scar that he had sustained during his battle with Earth Gaelis, and that a typical dose did not help to improve its appearance. Then, Michaela was able to heal him. There was astonishment on the part of the dragon. Rogue was informed by a little adorable dragon that Michaela was attempting to conceal her presence from them in order to avoid being discovered by them. Inez inquired as to whether or not she had a unique ability of her own, and it turned out that it was the healer's advanced skill. During the time when Rogue was petting Michaela's head and telling her that she was incredible, the dragon advised her to try to remember. They were informed by the dragon that he had managed to conquer the little girl and become her master. In addition, he stated that it was irrelevant whether or not she possessed a highly developed skill. What was important was the level of her skill. In the event that she was below average, he expressed to them that she was not worthy of consideration and began to develop feelings for her already. Incredible as it may sound, she was able to cure a scar on a dragon of the S level without any complications whatsoever. Michaela responded that she could use her healing skills just as much, and she asked Dragon to give her some time to think about it. It was very important to her to show how much she was worth. She told him to look at the scar on the part of his wings that held them together. Truth be told, Dragon did not have any of it with her. He didn't like the idea of adding someone to their group. Dragon explained to her that it was a scar that he had sustained during his battle with Earth Gaelis, and that a typical dose did not help to improve its appearance. Then, Michaela was able to heal him. It came as a surprise to Dragon that this should lead to him beginning to like her already. Incredible as it may sound, she was able to cure a scar on a dragon of the S level without any complications whatsoever. She had been training in the arts of healing since she was still in her hometown. When he heard her say hometown, he asked if she meant the elf village. But she told him no, and told him she was from a place far away from this continent, a country for only elves. When Inez heard this, she tried remembering where she had heard that from before. She spoke out loud that she had heard rumors about this place before. Michaela told her the place was gone, and she had always been alone ever since she left her country. 
She informed them that she had traveled from village to village and had now arrived in the country. She was afraid that no one would recognize her, but before she could say anything else, Dragon called her name and crawled up onto her lap to sit in it. It was a positive thing that he told her that he did not get the impression that she had any malicious intentions. It seems that the Rouge Healing Dragon had a more lenient attitude toward Michaela, according to Inez. In addition to this, she informed him that Michaela was an expert healer and that there was no reason to release her from her duties. Rouge was delighted to have her join their company, and she expressed her gratitude for the opportunity to do so. Not at all. She would no longer be alone herself. Rouge told her and Dragon that he was going to go for a walk with Nidhogg in the Empire before parting ways with them. He also mentioned that he would meet Ascalon later. He recalled the party that had taken place the night before and inquired about everyone's well-being. Inez inquired as to whether or not he had, at long last, found a way to realize his desire to have friends. He told her the people of the guild welcomed him back when he got there and started a party. It was at that moment he experienced anything like that. They all went to the inn after that, but he was too excited to sleep. As they were walking, some men decided it was a best to attack them. One of them asked Rouge if they were going home, and these guys really didn't know who this guy was. The man introduced himself as a B-rank adventurer and even said his name was Gold. He told them it was sad to have a meeting in a broken inn like that. He also asked that they show him their status, threatening not to let them off the hook if they refused to show him. This is so funny. Someone as powerful as Rouge is being threatened. Rouge gets excited that someone is extorting him. He then shows the man his status. In Gold's mind, he wonders why he seems so excited. When Gold saw his rank, he laughed at him and called him a newbie. The next thing he said was that they would have to pay them a fee and they would let them off. He said that if they didn't pay, they would be in a world of pain. Inez was pissed at their audacity. She called them fools and was ready to fight, but Rouge told them they didn't have much, only about three bronze coins in total. Inez tried stopping him, but he told her it was okay, and if that was the rule of the adventurers, they had to abide by it. He is powerful but dumb too. Gold hugged him, telling him he followed the order of his seniors. They told him that if he didn't have enough money, he could give Inez to them. That was where Rogue lost it. He kicked him, telling him he didn't deserve his respect. The others kept calling their boss, but he was long gone. One of them yelled, telling them that they were letting him go because he was a newbie, but he looked down on them and they were going to be in a world of pain. One of them asked if Rouge thought he was some hero of justice, but he attacked them with destruction magic. He used cancellation magic on the others. He beat them up and left his bronze coins for the boss. He also thanked him for the lesson. He is so hilarious. Which lesson was he thanking them for? Inez praised him and called him amazing. Gold avoided getting seen by them, and he mumbled that he wasn't ever going to forgive Rouge. Rouge told Inez he wasn't that amazing, and that if Inez was to do it, Gold on the floor was petrified that they were walking freely in his territory and said they should think they could go about their life freely. When Michaela got to the guild with Dragon, she was surprised to see how drunk the men were and thought they were sick. She treated them all instantly. They all woke up and realized they were all healed from the hangover, the booze they drank gave them. When Rogue got to the inn, one of the adventurers asked if she was the girl from the previous day. He told them she was now his new disciple and told her to greet them as her seniors. She was excited. She introduced herself to Raggard, who did the same and also introduced her to Grand. Rogue told them he was there to take on a request, and the two men told him to leave that to them as they were here as his instructors. They then gave him a request form, which was to exterminate slimes in the Gura forest. He was excited and told the two of them to take good care of him. He told them he would also catch up with both of them soon. They all left for the task they had been given. The attendant in the guild was excited they were going. Suddenly, she was another request form, explained more details about the job. It was stated in the form that there were dangerous S-rank dragons in the forest, but they were far gone and there was no way she could tell them. But she decided to have confidence in their strength. When they got to the forest, Michaela used her magic on one of the slimes. As she did, Rouge felt fulfilled after getting his first request as an adventurer. He thought about everything he had done to get to this point, how he also had to travel all the way to Gura Forest with his mentors and followers. Interrupting his thoughts, Raggard explained to them that slimes have enzymes in their body that help them absorb nutrients from their surroundings. He called them decomposers of the forest. He also said that it was really hot and that the nutrients in the forest were really rich, which was why the slimes seemed to be multiplying. He also told him that it was good that Inez hadn't come. Rogue added that Inez and Dragon got resurrected through necromancy and wouldn't do well in sunlight, so they sat the mission out. They both wished them good luck, 
but he left them in charge of maintaining the undead army in the swamp area. As they kept fighting in the forest, it seemed Michaela had great recovery magic, but little to no offensive magic. She apologized and told him she would be of better use to him, but he told her not to worry about it. He told her it was rare to come across a talent who could do well in both offense and defense, and she was amazing for being able to excel in one of the two. She was happy he said this. She thanked him and told him she was going to do her best. He then explained to her how their party was composed. Inez and Dragon were to be in the front lines, while he, a mid-range magic user, stayed in the middle, and Michaela's role was to give support and stay at the back. The next question he asked her was, who is going to be the target of their enemies? She had to give it some thought before she could respond. After that, he inquired once more about the enemy's possible targets and the individuals who would provide them with an advantage in the fight that they lost first. Obviously, it was her, but let's see if she can answer the question correctly. She got it correct and told him. Then, she followed up by saying that if that was the case, the first thing she should learn to do is defend herself rather than attack. Rogue congratulated her on correctly obtaining the solution and cautioned her not to rush things. He additionally advised her that the next time, they would select a mission that required defense magic. After that, Gran saw this as an opportunity and asked whether or not they ought to move forward with the golem extraction. Raygird responded by stating that this was an excellent opportunity for their defense to excel. He said that everyone who works in a frontline position, such as a swordsman, must first learn how to defend themselves, and he offered to offer them some instruction. After that, Rogue informed Grand that he was going to be in charge of everything that was going to take place there. He is so confident in his capabilities. He didn't even stress them. It isn't new to Grand and Raygird how strong he is, so they really didn't have any issue leaving it in his hands. He then asked for Raygird's sword. As he gave him, he told him the sword wasn't as amazing and asked if he was sure he really wanted to use it. Rogue told him it was fine as long as it was a sword. He then used Dragon Affinity Enchant and defeated all the slimes at once. They were all surprised. Michaela praised him. Raygird asked what spell it was. He was seriously excited to have witnessed the spell he used. He asked if it was really the S-rank magic level and asked how he was able to do it with his sword. Before he knew it, Raygird and Michaela were bowing to him, begging him to teach them to use it. He agreed to teach them, and they were happy, but it turned out they were being watched by someone or something. Who could this have been? The person watching them observed and used fire and wind compound magic to try attacking them, but Rogue was fast enough to stop the attack. The others were surprised and wondered where the attack came from, so he canceled the attack. Their enemies came out and asked if they were scared. One of them tried taking Michaela from him, and as he struggled with him, he realized he had met this person before. Remembering it was Gold, the man that he beat earlier, he was furious. Gold told him he was here to repay the debt he owed him earlier. He really didn't learn his lesson after he got beaten up by his group. He definitely abandoned them and looked for stronger people who could help him defeat Rogue. He also told him to watch as he was able to gather strong allies. He then called them out and said he was finally able to capture the rumored Rogue. But before they could do anything to them, a dragon carried Gold with its claw. Everyone was surprised and wondered why a dragon was there. They realized the dragon wasn't just one, but two of them. They started panicking. The dragon swallowed gold, and the men told themselves they had to report this to their leader, Void. Rogue heard the name and wondered who it was, but they said they weren't going to do that. They decided to defeat the dragon themselves, but could they really do that? It seemed they had so much confidence in their power and didn't even care a ton about the man who brought them to this place. They are so heartless. As they were about to fight, Gold yelled that they had saved him before defeating the dragon. He was so helpless. They probably weren't even listening to him. Raygird saw what they were doing and asked if they really were planning to release such a crazy amount of power at once. Michaela was scared. She was terrified. Rogue told her the method they were using was really bad, and she decided to stop them. Before he left, he petted her head. As he walked towards them, Raygird called him, but he didn't answer him. Gran walked towards him and stopped him to ask if he was really going to be facing a dragon on his own. They knew he was powerful, but he was facing a dragon all by himself. They didn't know if he could really pull that off by himself, but he didn't answer. And instead of doing that, he told Gran to help him take care of Michaela. The men were preparing to use their magic to fight. They used their magic called Handle Hammer to attack the dragon, but it didn't work. The dragon evaded the attack. This dragon is quite stronger than they had imagined. When they saw this, one of them alerted them to conjure their barrier attack as the dragon was heading towards them. The dragon was furious and was ready to kill them all. It even broke their barrier magic. They were surprised. 
and seeing that they had been overpowered, they proceeded to run. But where were they running to? Luck enough for them, the dragon hasn't used its fire breath. One of them yelled that the dragon would be around SS rank. They didn't have any more mana at this point. Will they all perish or be saved by Rogue? Rogue then appeared and used the sword in his hand to stop the dragon from causing damage any further. He told the dragon to stop playing pranks. He is sure powerful. His confidence is over the roof. No wonder he has an s rank dragon as a follower. He didn't even use so much force to stop the dragon as he told it that its pranks had gone too far. He also told him that the guy in his mouth was a precious citizen and he was going to need him back. He is such a gentleman at heart. After the man was mean to him, he still didn't want him to get eaten by a dragon. The men in hoods were shocked and wondered who Rogue was. Rogue told the others that he didn't know the magic Nidhogg taught him would come as handy as this, so he used Dragon Strike to attack the dragon. He was able to attack one of them as the second escaped the attack. He was literally fighting two dragons at the same time. The dragon that had gold then decided to use fire on him. And as gold felt the heat in the dragon's mouth, he jumped out. He could have jumped out but decided to stay in the dragon's mouth, or the flash of his death made him think about an escape in that instant. The dragon breathed fire, and everyone was terrified. Raygird shouted that this fire couldn't be compared with the flames earlier. The men told each other to retreat. Rogue saw this and told them they didn't need to run as far and used Black Hole to stop the magic. He turned the huge flames from the dragon into a small black ball and used the sword in his hand to throw it to the dragon. He even told the dragon he was sorry for doing that and told it to sleep peacefully until spring. Everyone needs his level of bravery and confidence. Gold also fell as the dragon fell, wondering if he was going to die. No one helped him, and he landed on the ground together with the dragon. Everyone clapped for Rogue, and the men ran and yelled that they had to report to Void once again. Rogue tried to think of who Void might be. Michaela saw Gold running away and told Rogue, but he told him to let him be, and that they should take care of the dragon first. Raygard asked if the dragon was dead and if it was still going to move, but he told them he didn't kill the dragon. He just made them unconscious. He told them he didn't kill them as they were at fault for disturbing their hibernation in the first place. He told them he was going to take the dragons back to their nest. Michaela went to touch one of the dragons. He saw this and asked what she was doing. She told him she wanted to heal the dragon's wounds. After she did, they all saw that she had even gotten rid of their old wounds. Raygird called her kind as Rogue used dimensional magic to return the dragons to their hideout. Back to praising Michaela, Raygird told them they could never find recovery magic like this in the country. Rogue said he could tell who was more amazing, the elves or Michaela. Gran said that elves had been known to have an aptitude for healing for a long time. He explained that in the past, there was something known as the elf race, but countries and nobles had taken them as their private properties. He continued as he said that that was why in the Sardia Empire, the princess tried to protect the elf's rights two years ago. He told them that by giving the whole forest in the Obord region to the elves in exchange for recovery portions. He also added that the guild has been able to supply a higher amount of recovery magic and the number of deaths had gone down too. He even told them that because of this, they were able to continue adventuring without any worry. They spoke about different things before Rogue told them he needed to return the dragons to the forest first and ran with Michaela. As he left, Raygird and Gran talked about how powerful he was. They were amazed at how powerful he was and thanks to him they didn't have to do anything or even fight. At the Adventure Guild, the attendant welcomed them back and asked how their mission was. Rogue told them what happened. Raggard said they somehow made it back alive, and Michaela told her Rogue was so cool. The attendant wondered why they seemed so stressed and asked how bad beating slimes could have been, but they told her what they actually had to face. When she saw the report Rogue gave her, she started apologizing to them. She told them that was the worst mistake she could have made as a receptionist. She begged for their forgiveness. She totally forgot what she saw when they left. Rouge told her not to take it to heart. She told them this ended well just because Rogue was with them. One of the adventurers called them noisy. She told him she didn't expect him to be as strong as his status indicated, and that he was even able to defeat two SS rank dragons at the same time. When they heard the, the others jumped from where they were seated to their side to hear what happened. Everyone wanted to hear what had happened. As they were trying to reach where Rogue was, Kalfa entered and asked if she could have a bit of Rogue's time. He asked if something had happened. She told him there was something she wanted to talk to him about and asked if she could come to the cathedral with her for a little bit. She also tells Michaela to follow them as her invitation extends to her. Michaela is more like a sister than a follower. She also told her there was someone she would like her to meet. They then left the guild to the cathedral. 
As they did, Michaela asked what the cathedral was. Rogue told her he didn't know what it was, but all he knew was that it was the place where he went to meet Kalfa to cast her skill on him. Kalfa asked where Inez and Needhog were, and he told her they were doing maintenance of his army, seeing how the previous battle destroyed the majority of his army. She asked where his army came from. Rogue explained that they came from a few years ago, when a few countries were after him. Kalfa asked if it was from the period when the Seven Sages were known for the battle against the Inhumane. Rogue defended himself by telling her he didn't make a living into undead puppets unwillingly. She told him she knew what happened. Rogue explained that when he got the job, he couldn't control his power, and a bunch of undead came towards him at the orphanage he grew up in. He had a very difficult childhood. He told her that his orphanage was also invaded by demons, and he strived to be acknowledged by people around him. He added that he put in all effort to be stronger than everyone, but in the end, it just made people fear and hate him more than they did before he got stronger. This was definitely what made him decide he was going to have friends by any means possible. Kalfa told him that the Sardia Empire had also had its share of problems from the war, like economic inequality, orphans, and so many other issues. She told them that with all that, they still managed to maintain peace for about three to four years. Rogue said that he dreams of a world where his undead army doesn't increase. Kalfa told him it would be right as the Sardia Empire is moving on. She told them that the person they would be meeting was the person who would advance the empire. They entered the capital, and Michaela was amazed at how huge it was. In their head, they were trying to figure out who this person was and what they probably looked like. Kalfa told them that the royal princess didn't show her face to people often. But as Nad was no longer with them, she didn't have any choice but to come out to the open and do what she needed to do. Kalfa bowed to her and told the princess she had brought the person she wanted to meet. She added that she brought another person by her own judgment and apologized for doing so. As the princess came down from her throne, she told Kalfa it was okay and asked if the man there was the one she referred to as Rogue. Kalfa introduced them to Ruchiera, the princess, and looking at her, they were amazed she wasn't only beautiful but had ears just like Michaela. Rogue and Michaela didn't know when they shouted the wood elf. They were so shocked to have witnessed this. They would have so many questions to ask.